Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Mr. Embodiment, Mark Walsh. Hello, everybody. I'd like to start my introduction today with the question that I have as the title. Are you embodied? Sounds like a funny question, but believe me, it's a real one that is very relevant to today. Mark Walsh is one of the pioneers of what we know now as the embodiment movement, which has evolved out of our human need to heal and regain connection to and presence within our own bodies. His book, Embodiment, Movement Beyond Mindfulness, is actually a very informative book that is easy to read and apply. I really wanted to talk to Mark about embodiment because it is such a necessary concept today and because it has been a key focus for him for many years, both personally and professionally. In this interview dialogue, we dive into what embodiment is, what causes disembodiment and derealization, and ways we can all return to a place of centered groundedness within our own body. As you will soon hear, there are some points that Mark and I did not agree upon and had what I call a healthy conflict. I have not edited it out of the podcast because I personally feel healthy conflict is an essential part of any relationship as long as we can stay connected at the heart while we're in a healthy conflict. And if we do, we're sure to learn something important that may help us or all involved. I feel Mark's work is important, that he has a lot to offer, and hope you find this podcast informative and useful in your life. Enjoy my dialogue and my sparring matches with Mark Walsh. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very interesting guest, Mark Walsh. I was turned on to Mark and his Embodied Movement Conference by a friend, and I ended up having conversation with Mark, and the conference was very, very comprehensive with many speakers on embodiment. And then I just happened one day to, out of curiosity, just search his name on Amazon and found his book, Embodiment movement beyond mindfulness and it's right here so you can see what it looks like and there he is the man himself flying through the air like michael jackson (laughs) and uh it's a great book it's a lovely book because it's easy to read so i'd give you a heads up on that one mark good job and uh we're gonna have a good discussion today a dialogue on Well, on embodiment, and um, I've titled our our show today, Are You Embodied? (laughs) Because that's an important question to ask. So, uh, Mark, thank you, and welcome to Living 4D. Pleasure, Paul. Good to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I think I've made my whole career of uh, making him what can be a complicated subject relatively simple and practical. And I, I wrote that book as what I'd call a toilet book. You know, you could read bits of it on the toilet in short chunks, accessible. Uh, since written a sort of second book, it's a bit of a more of a textbook, but um, yeah, that's really uh, my life's work condensed in something you could read in a couple of hours. Well, that means for a lot of constipated people that you need to write some more books. <laughs> Ten minutes a day, maybe. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Actually, it was it was difficult for me to write a book because I'm not very like you know I'm quite ADHD. I'm not very structured in my thinking. I love to teach, but to write was a new thing. So I was very happy when I wrote that. And then the second book, of course, is much easier as books tend to be. Right. Yes, you do have another one, um, uh, uh, ebook, and uh, I wrote the title of it down. Could you give us the title of the ebook? Because that one's more for people teaching embodiment. If I'm remembering correctly uh, well it's, it's no yeah it's no it's it's fully out the body and training and coaching so that's more for teachers oh, okay i didn't see that one on amazon is that on amazon yeah no it should be up there now it's published by open university press that one and uh, it's not been out it's only been a couple of months up so um yeah it should still be available in the states and everywhere else so okay and you do have an ebook on teaching embodiment am i am i right there I've got all sorts out. We've got a podcast. We've got a YouTube channel. We've, you know, we did the conference, obviously, you know, but these days ele- electronically a lot. You know, we do a lot of courses um, teaching online and uh, reaching people through the internet. It's just such a scalable thing where there's only so many people that will ever read a book or go to a workshop and um, find the electronic mediums, despite the potential contradiction there with the work, but actually very, very useful for getting this work out to many people. Well, I tell people that the digital technologies of today are basically a form of a mind, 
And I tell people a mind makes a far better servant than a master. So if you use the technology in beneficial ways, it's beneficial. But if you let the technology use you, well, all you got to do is look out the window and see what happens. Yeah, I, I had a lovely weekend this weekend. Lockdown is easing in the UK. And we had a martial arts camp in the woods. Uh, this is Sistema, Russian martial arts. I've done for a little while, done other martial arts too. And it, but it was so nice just to sit in the woods without mobile phones, away from technology, to break bread, you know, literally to eat together. People camping, you know, doing stuff on the grass. We still had to do it distance, but we managed to do some work with sticks and different things. And it was just so nice to have that human contact again. And I, and I, and I think there's no replacing that. And as an embodiment teacher, that is so critical that we understand the essence of sort of co-regulation and how we um, connect with each other, how we help each other stay calm and sane that we're social animals, you know, that's so important to never forget that. And at the same time, you know, the internet can be a wonderful tool. Yeah, well, that's the thing about a double-edged sword. It can be a useful tool or it can be the death of you or the other person. I'd love it, Mark, if you could give us a biographical sketch of your life and what led you to focus so much of your time and energy on the issues of embodiment. Yeah, I mean, my story in a, in a way is a sort of microcosm of why embodiment exists as a subject. And I often say that it really came out of failure, you know, personal failure representing one of the chief failures of our civilization, which while wonderful in many ways is, we could say, sort of hypercognitive, you know, it lives from the neck up. And that was certainly me. As a teenager, I literally read every book in the library and they had to order in fresh books from Cambridge University nearby just to give me something to read because I just was absorbing so much information. I had very high <laughs> IQ. Um, and I was told that was what life was about. My parents were teachers. We always had books around. You know, Cognitive knowledge about things was what I was told was what mattered. Um, and that will certainly get you so far. It's certainly not a bad thing. I'm glad we have books. I'm glad we have the internet. However, it didn't make me happy. And as a teenager, I, I, you know, just bumped into addiction. I bumped into just relationships and intimacy for the first time and did horribly at those. Um, I bumped into depression, mental health stuff, which, of course, is as embodied, not just mental. Um, and I hadn't really had any character education. So I'd had a lot of cognitive education, but I had no training in being. And I'd had no training in these core skills of life you know, whether they be social skills or self-regulation skills or whatever it was. And that just led to really almost me killing myself a, a, as a teenager, quite a young age. And I, I, I knew something was wrong. So I was like, okay, if I'm so, everyone's telling me I'm clever. I've read all the books, literally in my school. And I'm being told oh, I'm a super smart guy. Yeah, I'm holding a razor blade to my wrists and I'm alcoholic and I'm miserable at my first intimate relationships. And I was smart enough to go, okay, there must be some serious ways that I'm not smart. And I went, well, what are those ways? And I didn't really know where to start until I went to university and I was heartbroken and alcoholic and miserable. And I walked into an Aikido school, a dojo, which was kind of in the, actually just in the sports center of the university. And I hadn't even walked in the library yet, even though I'd been there a week, because I thought, why bother? The dancer's not in the library. I've already read another. It's just a bigger library. I read the other one. I don't think a bigger library is going to help, you know. Uh, but this Aikido school spoke to me on kind of a visceral body level and something deep in me went, you need this. And I did not miss a class for three years at university. And I, through Aikido, originally thought it was about Aikido. And then I realized that Aikido is just one of what I would now call embodied arts, body mind arts you know we could say embodiment is the umbrella term for arts that involve the body but in a mindful way that involve the body and working through the body to the self so working on ourselves through the body which is obviously different than just exercise which is you know perfectly valid i did some pull-ups yesterday nothing wrong with exercise i like exercise it's important for our health but embodiment is more than exercise in the sense that you're you're not just working on the physical body you're trying to develop yourself as a person through the body Right. Well, you have some interesting parallels with my wife, Penny, because both her parents were teachers and she graduated from Cambridge University. Yeah, I've just heard she was uh, went to school in Brighton, where I live now as well. So I was surprised that she came on to do the technical stuff with her English accent. I was like, oh, OK. Hello. So, <laughs> nice to meet her. You know, the fact that you focus so much of your time and energy on embodiment strongly suggests that you're of the opinion that there are a lot of people that are somewhat disembodied. Could you please share what it means to be embodied and what it means 
uh, and and what some good indicators are that a person is indeed embodied? Great question. So the first thing is this: let's get the language uh, clear. So everyone is unconsciously embodied. So what I mean by that is we all have a personality. We all have a set of patterns. And, um, you know, if you look at children, they're, they're all relatively the same all around the world. You know, they all have a certain posture, a certain breathing. They're all very free in their emotions and their movement. They've certainly got a lot to learn, but they, they, there's a balance to them. And they're not that, except maybe in sort of color or things like that. They're actually very similar. But over life, culture comes in, first family systems come in, trauma comes in. That shapes us a particular way. So we all have that shaping. Yeah. And it's literal and metaphorical when I say shaping, literal and metaphorical. Um, so everyone's unconsciously embodied. So you can't be more or less unconsciously embodied because we're all the same in that sense. Yeah. However, you can become more consciously embodied. You can become more aware of those patterns and states. So we have short term states and long term patterns. And you can also influence those states and patterns. So you can shift your state. For example, I did a really full on therapy session before this interview and I had five minutes to shift my state because I was a mess. And I was like, hang on, I'm going to be interviewed in five minutes, you know. So I, I was able to have that five minutes to shift my state consciously. And also I'm shifting my longer term pattern through longer term practice. So the martial arts that I do is part of that, for example. The yoga I do is part of that. The dance I do is part of that. The meditation I did this morning and breath work is part of that. So these are all ways we can become more consciously embodied. Uh, in terms of indicators, uh, there's well-being. That's not my focus. Kind of, ha- you know, well-being and happiness isn't so much my focus. Um, you can also sense it in others. If someone's in their body, uh, if someone's body aware, there's a way in which that's attractive. Where that's, it's kind of obvious. Like dogs and children will come up to you. It's a, it's a <laughs> it's a tangible thing. Uh, also, just intention levels. You'll see much lower tension levels in people that are body aware because naturally, if I've got my shoulders up here, I'm not feeling it. As soon as I feel it, I want to drop them, right? So you'll, you, because it's just unpleasant. So you'll see lower tension levels. Uh, you'll see certain skill sets. So I've taken embodiment, which is an ab- quite an abstract term, and broken it down into embodied intelligence. And that has a very concrete set of eight different types of skill sets. And I could ask a person questions that would, indicate let's take self-regulation so what i did between the two interviews i had to self-regulate that's a skill that's a concrete skill you can be better or worse at yeah and some people have amazing self-regulation some people just don't and it's pretty obvious so that's one of the skill sets uh, we could look at and i you know as i work with students we'll sort of assess their skill sets and then we'll give them practices to fill in some of the weak spots you're looking for the, the the quadrant model in the book. Yeah, yeah, that's the the sort of central model we use in, ma- in many of our courses. Awareness and choice, self and other. So self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, like empathy, listening, um, and then um, uh, leadership, influence. So maybe, I'll, should I give an example of any more of that? Or where do you want to go with this? Well, I think I think that's good. I'm just sort of letting you share what you you have in response to the, question uh, you know there's a uh, one of the thoughts that two thoughts that came to me one uh, i practice shamanism and have for many many years so i do a lot of what's called soul recovery which is really the functional equivalent in native american indian speak of of being disembodied and so the you know i think what you're really describing is, is what i would classify as embodiment being represented in an individual's conscious awareness of self other and relationships to persons places and things and a person can be be, uh, what i would say disembodied in the sense that their consciousness is tied up somewhere either in a trauma or in their unconscious due to things like the the shadow or uh it can be illnesses. It can be a variety of things. Even external stressors, such as electromagnetic pollution, have been shown to uh, trigger a variety of dysfunctions in people if the exposure is strong enough. And you know, having studied the shadow quite a bit, Robert A. Johnson is a famous union analyst. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he his book on the shadow is is probably one of the best I've ever seen out there. And he really goes at 
in great detail to describe that the shadow is actually developed as a process of enculturation because through enculturation, we have to repress all of the spontaneous urges and desires that are normal to our, you know, you can call it the self or you could call it the more primitive self, such as, you know, it's not really polite to play with your genitals in public, for example, or in our culture, if you dance naked in the rain where other people can see you, they'd probably get you arrested. So he describes how when a child, even in tribal societies, would go through enculturation in order to fit in and therefore in order to be accepted and to feel loved, one has to repress the parts of themselves that don't fit into the model of enculturation being used. And because those are aspects of our psyche that are real, they're being pushed down into the unconscious or the areas that the conscious mind doesn't interact with because to bring those up into consciousness and act them out would, would lead to uh, problems of many types, such as being kicked out of school or put in jail or kicked out of your church or whatever. So th though I agree with what you're saying regarding embodiment, we're all embodied, but I think the distinction I'm trying to make is that now this could get technical because we'd have to get into the nature of the soul, but we're, we're all here. We're all no, no part of us is ever lost. Even in soul loss, I find the broken pieces in that person's own field. So it's not like I have to go uh, wandering round about the countryside to look for them. They're in their own field, but they're not consciously accessing them. And once those pieces of the soul are recovered, there's a noticeable, a tangible change. For example, many people will say things like, within seconds of the ceremony finishing, they will say, wow, I can see colors so much better, or I can hear better, or I can smell better, or all of a sudden they're able to feel parts of their body that they couldn't feel before. So what, And because a lot of these uh, soul loss incidents relate to childhood trauma, these are pieces of themselves that they haven't been accessing for potentially 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden now they're feeling these things come back online. So it's kind of like somebody has a part of their psyche tucked away, but they forgot where it is and couldn't access it. So that's kind of the distinction I was making. If, if there's any comments you want to share in that regard, feel free. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that. It makes a lot of sense. It's certainly trauma is massively important, and we can talk about that. And ritual can be super, super helpful. We can talk about that. Um, I'd also say it doesn't need to be that complicated. So really, I just think of awareness, range, and choice. People lose a certain amount of their range, and they might lose that through enculturation, through trauma, through you know whatever the influence is. We have we develop patterns which made sense at the time, you know, to fit in as a kid or to deal with some pattern, you know, something our dad was a drinker or whatever it was. We have some pattern we developed and it becomes an imperative, like have to be nice or have to be fierce or can't be scared or can't be angry, whatever it is. Right. Uh, and they get laid down as embodied patterns and then our range gets limited. So we have less freedom to respond appropriately to situations. So I, I tend to see it mostly just in terms of range. Um, and skill sets. Hi, everybody. I know this past year has been hard on all of us, but there are many simple, practical, and highly effective things anyone can do to create more health and freedom in their lives. And the Czech Academy offers mastery of exactly those kinds of tools and approaches. So many people have stopped moving, stopped eating and sleeping well, suffered from anxiety and depression from being stuck inside, struggled as their relationships fell apart at home, and many have buckled under the weight of financial strain. Naturally, all that physical, emotional, and mental stress leads to a lot of complicated health challenges, challenges that the Western medicine system honestly isn't designed for handling. The good news is you can help. You can help people who've really been hurt this year. In fact, you can do more than help them recover. You can help them to grow and thrive and be healthier than ever before. And here's how. On July 15th, this Thursday, I'll be opening up the application window for the Czech Academy where you'll learn all the holistic health and performance techniques I've developed over the 37 years of my career. 
Some of the methods you'll learn right up front in your academy training are the healing power of clean, organic foods and how to individualize diets to get the optimal response for each person's unique needs, the essentials of how to assess and manage each person's stress levels, stretching and postural correction techniques to balance the body, breathing pattern assessment and correction techniques, my simple, powerful, globally applicable 1234 formula for assessment and correction of any client's life challenges. How to assess and correct core function for optimal stability, injury prevention, rehabilitation, superior athletic development, and much more. Wherever you are, whatever your education level, the Academy will open doors for you to help a whole lot of people in this world. You will learn how to assess and correct challenges that are common to most all people, yet the approach we teach is highly practical and uncommon in the health and exercise industry to this very day. Learn more about the Czech Academy now at checkinstitute.com forward slash L number 4 D Academy. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash L 4 D Academy. Come join us and be the change the world needs now. Here's where I'd, I'd question if we ask people to take on a belief system. Uh, then it, that's a barrier to people accessing the work. So if there's a belief system, say, around soul retrieval, I mean, that's a belief system that I personally doesn't freak me out, but I have a lot of clients who wouldn't wouldn't be cool with that. They, they, that would just immediately shut them down. So I, I would suggest the model to use for our work would be the one with the least belief systems required, uh, the one which most fits with a sort of worldview that's current for most people. Uh, and that's what I've really endeavored to do. I think for for you working in the public sphere, in the mode that you're working, that's fine. But I am world famous for working with people that have failed in medical systems and traditional approaches and have spent 37 years studying a wide variety of, of uh, approaches and, and systems and belief systems. And ultimately, for me, what I do is I say, okay, when I evaluate a patient, and what's going on with them, I say, which tool is appropriate for the job? By the time they get to me, they don't really give a shit about my belief system. They only want results. And if I didn't get results, I wouldn't be in business. So I think a belief system is really a collection of ideas that many reject without having investigated or done the work to see if it's actually real or not. So it just becomes intellectual uh, chess is all it does. But at the end of the day, as, as I was saying, if, if you can do work within any belief system, regardless of whether it's accepted or not, but it produces tangible results, then that gives merit to it and says that those that have been helped by it are most likely to study it and, and be the bearer of that gift to others. And I believe that because there's so many belief systems out there, we tend to migrate toward the people that resonate with our own belief systems. And it's when that in a belief system, by definition, is a closed system. So when we're not able to get help within that closed system, that's when we either have a choice, stay where we're at or think outside of the box and try something new. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's a sort of something in, in recovery called the gift, gift, gift of desperation when people have tried things and they're, they're willing to go somewhere new. And I like that a lot. And, um, you know, I, I definitely like the approach of well, let's try things. You know, I have a group of cynical business people or soldiers or police, and I'm, I've worked with everyone over the years, you know, 50 countries at least, um, maybe 300 occupations. And I'll say, look, don't believe me, but just give this a go. And, you know, who has some stress in their life and the hands will go up? And I'll say, right, who's willing to try an, an exercise? You know, it comes from martial arts. It's called centering. Give it a go uh, for two minutes. If you don't like it, you can leave. I'll put you down as in. HR hey, will never find out. If you do like it, shut up. Listen to what I have to say. Give some more stuff a go. And they give me two minutes. I give them the exercise. And afterwards, I say, well, who feels less stressed now? And all the hands go up, you know, from a real simple exercise. So by not asking people to believe anything, just giving them something to try, then that can get the ball rolling. And then people might be more open to stuff that's maybe a little bit outside their normal reference, frame of reference. Well, that's pretty much the same line of thinking that I give people exactly. I say, look, you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. 
So if you don't try, you won't know. Um, you know, in reading your book, I got the sense that you feel the body is largely the physical space that the matter of our body is invested in. How do you define where the body begins and ends and what is your concept of embodiment and how do you define the edges or limits of what contains us? So what is, what is embodied in your model is really what I'm asking. Sure, sure. So, that, you know, some of that would get us into the philosophy realm, which isn't really what I do. Um, what I would say, however, is you've already pointed to something really important, which is that we're always embodied in place and in relationship. So, for example, um, you know, we have a particular embodiment with certain people in certain cultural background, could be intergenerational trauma, could just be the culture we grew up in. Uh, and we're always embodied in place. Like I was in the woods all weekend. It's very different than being three floors up in Brighton, where I am now, Yeah, even though we're only a few hours away from where I was at the weekend. So I think if we're going to talk about embodiment, we have to talk about the bit, we could say the bigger body of nature and the social body. We can't ignore those things. Um, so, yeah. Um, the parts of my, what I would define as my body, the parts that you're not allowed to lick and I wouldn't want you to kick would be my slightly comical reply to that. And I, and I think if we get into philosophical territory, it, it just becomes masturbation. And I think most people have a, a sense of what their body is and we could argue about the limits of that, but it's, um, it's pretty commonsensical. Well, that's interesting that you say that. So I, I'm, I'm going to post a question to you. What does the word philosophy mean? No, is my response to that. <laughs> it means the study of wisdom. And wisdom is the product of knowledge, and knowledge is the product of experience. So, uh, you know, I, I, I understand your point in regard to how and why you're making it. But as a guy who's spent thousands and thousands of hours and years of his life studying philosophy and found it to be some of the richest, most psychologically stabilizing material you know, like any other field there's a lot of differences of opinion but there is in the embodiment field as well but to me that i can't uh, ignore thousands of years of the greatest minds debating the most important topics about what life is and and just put it on the shelf and and, and absolutely <laughs> ignore it Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, you just put it. Oh, let me push back here, Paul, because you talk about the greatest minds. The greatest minds have got us here. Okay. The greatest levels of mental ill health, environmental destruction. You know, the greatest minds have got us to this point. And there's a whole philosophy of embodiment Nietzsche, Heidegger, there's people you could really go into, the French anthropologists. You know, there's loads of people you there's a, In my new book, there's a whole chapter written by my Russian colleague who is much more philosophical than me. I'm an engineer, okay? I'm a practical guy, okay? And if people want to sit around in black polo nets, smoking roll-ups, wanking each other off mentally, they can do it. But I'm, I'll be doing something practical next door, you know? And it's uh, it's just not my expertise, Paul. So um, I don't want to speak – I don't want to speak about things I have some practical knowledge of. Yeah, oh, that's cool. I mean, I'm just, I'm just simply – making the statement that if if we reject philosophy which is the study of wisdom that's that's rejecting wisdom which seems to me to be a, a a dangerous approach but i can totally respect your opinion okay let's take a philosopher any philosophy you like so socrates whatever plato um what was plato's embodiment we have no idea so we actually have no idea about his real wisdom well, can you can you specify what exactly you are saying when you say what was Plato's embodiment? What, what, how did he stand? How did he breathe? Was he passionate? Could he get laid? Could he make you laugh? Could he could he dance at a party? I'm not interested in just the guy's words because we know nothing about him if all we know is his words. Nothing. Well, that's let's talk about that because that's a really interesting concept. <laughs> <laughs> like like there's a great philosopher of breath which is a really obscure topic from finland who i had on my podcast and he'll say you know like descartes said to do philosophy you should uh cut off the breath and go inside be as least embodied as possible freud said the same thing i should lie on the couch be as comfortable as possible so you don't feel your body and where has that got us you know what what you're doing in my opinion is looking at, at at people that were uh, lacking their own embodiment and 
at the time, maybe we're making advances on the level of knowledge in some field, but I don't think would be uh, emissaries of uh, a wholesome truth, or you wouldn't be bringing them up. But I will, I will take your own proposition on Plato and hand it right back to you, Mark. You wrote a book. Thousands of people are going to read that book. Not one of them is likely to ever see you. This is a couple. There's a couple of things I added to that book to make it not just talking about embodiment. One, it's full of practical stuff for people to try. Secondly, I add in a lot of narrative story. So in that, so originally I wrote the book and it was just talking about embodiment, and then I went. This is like dancing about architecture. This is the wrong format. This is ridiculous, precisely because of what you just said, Paul. So good pushback, by the way. Um, and so then I added the exercises to make it an experience for people. And I added some of my own narrative stories that are more poetic. There's poems in there. There's juiciness in there. And like that, I wanted to bring it to life. And for me, that creates a different experience than simply talking about embodiment. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll just leave that there because I can go at this for a long time. <laughs> Good sparring, though. I like that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, you know, the thing is, yeah, this this question can be brought back to something that we could call a priori in consciousness, and that is what one chooses to believe becomes their own reality. And what Mark shares in Mark's book is Mark's reality, because that's all he really has. And I think that people like Freud, Nietzsche, any of them were all really just showing us what their reality as an individual was. And I think that's why any way we can study each other or learn from each other, whether we agree or disagree, if we take the position that that's what it's like to be Frederick Nietzsche, or that's what it's like to be Freud or Jung or Einstein, then we can say, if we're wise, we can say, oh, that works for me or that doesn't work for me. And, you know, for example, Osho was somebody that got a lot of bad press and did a lot of crazy shit. But at the same time, there's pieces of his work. And by the way, he did a hell of a lot on embodiment. There's pieces of his work that we can use whether or not we like the way he handled himself as a guru, et cetera. Um, in my clinical experience working with countless people of suffering from some degree of embodiment challenges, I found that the etiology of their inability to be fully in themselves often stems from a variety of issues and influences. And here's your words coming up. Among the most common and dangerous that I see causing problems of embodiment are belief systems, trauma of one form or another, uh, but when it comes back to its source, it leads to, often leads to a parent acting out of belief systems that they were programmed with and that their pro parents were programmed with. So by far the most common source of belief systems that lead to physical, emotional, and mental uh, trauma are often religious in nature. I wondered if you could share what you find to be the most common source of challenges with being embodied. Yeah, how do we get disembodied? <laughs> And yeah, and, and any thoughts that you have on what I just shared there, because uh, that that's something that you know isn't out of a book. That's me, thirty-seven years of clinical experience. I hear that. I hear that. Um, how do we get if embodiment is just connection, right? Connection to self, connection through others, connection to values, connection to the world. How do we get disconnected? Is the question. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, there is always, always the societal conditioning we've talked about already, which is certain things are allowed, certain things are not allowed, certain things are rewarded, certain things are punished. When there's a, a serious threat to the self, when there's a splitting, um, when something's overwhelming, we could call that trauma. And that's numbing, right? There's something that's too intense to feel, so we cut off from our bodies as a way to not feel the most painful thing. Um, so trauma, whether that be sort of little t micro traumas or, you know, big events, wars and rapes and horrible things like that, you know, that is a, a major source of disembodiment that could be personal or it could be cultural. Like I've worked a lot in Russia. My wife's from the Ukraine. I've worked in Israel a lot. I'm from an Irish background myself. There's a cultural trauma as well as, as personal ones. Um, so one simple things, like I don't know if you noticed, I just stood up. So I don't sit down for more than half an hour at a time. 
Yeah. I always stand up and move around. Sitting down is numbing. Uh, spending your time on your phone all day long is numbing. Yeah. Um, what else is numbing? The pace of modern life. You know, if you're on the tube or the New York Underground, it's, what is it called in New York, the Metro? People are moving so quick they can't really feel. Um, it's also not being around nature. It was so much easier to feel my body in the woods this weekend than it is today, you know, in an apartment. Uh, these are all in it's who you're around if you're around a whole load of embodiment people you'll be more in your own body you know we're we're contagious in our embodiment in that way for for better and for worse if you're around a load of people who are traumatized and numb and cut off it's hard to maintain your own feeling so um, these are some of the factors that that come to mind i'm curious are you familiar with rudolf steiner at all yeah the steiner schools there's a steiner school in brighton i've got passing familiarity with them Steiner had a concept he called supersaturation, and basically this was one of the things he warned about with processed foods, alcohol, any real highly concentrated anything from sugar to any substance or even information. And so part of what I see going on in a very large scale from, from many avenues, be it uh, exercise or lack of exercise, uh, the lack of exercise being the opposite of supersaturation. So someone who has an exercise addiction would be supersaturating. Someone who's eating a lot of processed foods, drinking soda pop, alcohol, using uh, medical drugs or recreational drugs with too much frequency. Uh, but basically, Steiner showed that the more that the physiological systems in our body have thresholds, and that if we keep taking things beyond the threshold, the system resets itself higher and higher. And ultimately it pushes a person's capacity for satiation further and further and further. So what was one coffee a year later now takes three to do the same thing. Two years later takes five. And the next thing you know, you're, you're debilitating your internal systems. You know, uh, research shows that we are now processing more information in one day than people 100 years ago did in their entire lifetime. Wow. Yeah. So you're dealing with a flow of information that the human physiology really isn't designed to handle. So naturally, it's going to have to shut itself down in some way. But how it shuts itself down, for example, if, if, if you've got a, a child who's forced to now learn on a computer due to COVID-type restrictions they're bringing in a lot of information in a medium that's not a natural format that's excluding a lot of the environmental sensory connection. And that can be overwhelming to the child's mind. So paradoxically, while they're trying to learn, the mind's actually shutting down to try to protect the child from a flow of information that it can't control. In class, it might be easy just to raise your hand and, and say something to the teacher, but in, in an electronic medium, it's it's often not so easy. So I think that one of the problems that's leading to a lot of disembodied people or or lack of embodiment is the supersaturation on so many levels. Yeah, I and mean, you've got the idea of a mega stimulus. You know, I've heard um, certain foods, as you say, also things like porn described as mega stimuli that we just didn't evolve to handle them. You know, if you, if you think of the difference between porn and sort of, you know, one kind of slightly pretty girl in your village who you grew up with kind of thing is very different. And um, the idea of quantity of information, which isn't being processed, I think we're not, we're sort of force feeding ourselves without digesting information. I mean, how many podcasts do people listen to? You know, I'm certainly guilty of this. There's um, without actually becoming in terms of the podcast, becoming wisdom to use your word, so that information doesn't become wisdom without being properly chewed on. The other thing I'd, I'd say there is the lack of um, social co-regulation. So we're regulated self-regulation, like you do your yoga and meditation, but we're co-regulated socially, and that's so much easier in person with touch and rapport building. It's possible online, but much easier in person. Uh, and then we're eco-regulated right, by our environments. So not only are we force-feeding ourselves far more information than we can digest into wisdom, but we're that stress. We're doing that to a stressed system, which isn't in rest and digest mode. It's in that fight or flight mode, continuously. So yeah, I think that's um, spot on. Hi everybody, 
I imagine some of you are finding that your mind is not as sharp as it was, or that you can't seem to remember things as well, such as the last page you read in the book, or the key points from a meeting you just attended recently. Do you feel that your brain is taking longer to come online, or that your thinking gets muddled or fuzzy when you've got a lot to get done? If so, Organifi Pure may be just the magic you need. A key ingredient in Organifi Pure, called Neurofactor, showed a significant impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor, which has been widely reported to play a critical role in neuronal development, maintenance, repair, and protection against neurodegeneration. The certified organic combination of herbs in Organifi Pure not only enhances mental clarity and promotes brain-derived neurotropic factor to stimulate the development of new neural pathways, It aids in enhanced digestion, which is important because many cognitive problems are symptoms of poor digestion. To get your Organifi Pure and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and save 20% on any of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K20, that's check 20 during discount. Enjoy. You know, you, you you mentioned some words earlier that made me want to share a definition of love. I spent years meditating on what love really is uh, for a number of different reasons. But uh, I, I, to me, soul means consciousness within. So whatever level you look at that, I, I define soul as the consciousness within ourselves. So what soul is what's in Mark that lets Mark know it's Mark that's having the experience of being Mark Walsh. That's what I'm referring to as soul. So when I say this, my soul through these meditations taught me what love is. And my soul said, love is the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other. So when we look at that as a general statement, love is the flow of energy and information. Everything in the created universe is energy and information. Through empathic, I feel myself or the other. Compassionate, I understand myself or the other. Connection. So with that sort of underpinning, what I'm trying to say is it seems that a lot of what really relates to being embodied or having problems with embodiment has to do with the person's ability to handle the flow of energy and information and whether or not there's empathic and compassionate connection or whether it's some other form of uh, injunction like being forced to have to study things you don't like to study or be in places you don't want to be or being locked down when you don't want to be locked down because those are not uh, acts of love as a, as a, as a, they're more acts of, of uh, (laughs) rule. Um, But anyhow, I just wanted to share that with you because it seems that what we're really talking about here fits the model that I've created for love with the help of that, which speaks inside of me. Cool. Have you, uh, seen, uh, have you seen the nature of how people love themselves and others change through embodiment practices? And can you share any examples of what you've witnessed? Yeah. I mean, if you want to take care of yourself, you, you first need to be connected to yourself. Right. And, one of my students, Erica, she has a whole course for women who are too nice. That's her niche in the business world. Um, and she ha- re- first thing she says before she works on boundaries is self-connection. Because if you're not self-connected, you don't know that you have a boundary. Or like, it just goes to everything. Like, what am I going to eat this evening after this call? You know, am I going to rest or am I going to, uh, you know, hang out with my wife? You know, what do I really need? And, and if we're cut off from what we really need and, you know, there's, to take a bigger political picture, there's people out there in the world who'd quite like that. You know, every king, priest, and advertiser in the world would quite like that, right? Because we can then serve their needs. But the first thing is being connected, right? And then I can set boundaries, I can regulate, I can satiate needs or just be with the morning of unmet needs. You know, that's the the first self-connection thing. So if we're going to love ourselves, then absolutely the primary piece is, uh, is to come back to ourselves. It's also the basis of being in connection with others. And I think we can't talk about love without talking about connecting, right? Yeah. So for me, if somebody is not in contact with themselves, their chances of being in a healthy relationship of any kind, business, intimate, whatever, are pretty slim. But that self-connection is the basis of being able to connect with another person. 
Uh, and this is the basic relationship advice, isn't it, of any you know sex therapist or relationship counsellor or whatever, is you have to connect to yourself before you can know what you want, and then you can ask for what you want, you can set healthy boundaries, and those two things will form a good relationship. Um, and the same, whether it's relationship, we, we might say more abstractly spirit, or you might prefer soul. Some people might say Gaia or the planet. Those things are all based on self-connection as the foundation. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's like, how, how could you love without that and and also just say that you know love is often lacking operational instructions yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> i agree <laughs> the missing question is how so for example i was young and i you know i was educated religiously and, and i was told love thy neighbor and i was like okay that's a good idea well first of all what specifically do you mean by love you know love thy neighbor what what does that look like concretely i'm a very concrete person as you probably realized already and secondly i'd be like how do i do that in my body there's the beginning right if i can't do it in my body i, I never saw anyone to teach that i mean paul linden one of my teachers was the first person i said this said you know this is how we make love in the body right like what's the action of love and now we can tune into that by just waiting till we're sort of having a loving moment. We see a baby, we appreciate it. And, oh, the body softens and opens. And it's very cross-cultural, actually. Nobody contracts and twists when they're loving. Everybody softens and opens and expands cross-culturally. Right now, there are different expressions, different amounts of that, different ways it comes out. But the, the somatic pattern is, is pretty similar everywhere. And I never heard anyone talking about that. I just heard them say, love people, or try and be nice. And I'd be like, how? How? So embodiment is the how question. Philosophy is the why. Embodiment is the how. I think, too, fortunately, my definition of love states the flow of energy and information through empathic and or compassionate connection to self or others. So to feel oneself and to seek to understand oneself I think are acts of love and, and then other is to feel to, to what, what is, is, is the person having a terrible day? Do they need help? Do you understand their situation? To me, those are acts of love. And in my system, I teach my students a simple little rule. I before we always, which really is a, dictum I created because Christianity and, and particularly the Abrahamic religions are so oriented toward loving others, but negating the self, killing the ego. And I tell people, without your ego, you could not experience love. There would be no individuality, no, sent, no locus of your consciousness. So the concept of killing the ego is to kill the capacity for love, which really creates exactly the kind of crap we got going on right now. So it's really, uh, I think, important for us to, to really have a clear definition that we can work with when it comes to things like love, because if you don't have a clear definition, then you end up in the same problem we have with mind. Dr. Dan Siegel, who's a psychiatrist, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he describes how he went to, he, as a psychiatrist, he went to conferences all over the world to do with the mind and psychiatry and psychology, and nobody had a definition of mind. So he was confused as to how you could have an entire field with no definition to guide it and ultimately took it upon himself to get a team of about 40 intelligent people together to come up with a definition of mind. So I think part of, part of what we're, we're finding through our dialogue here is that, is that a lot of people really don't have an understanding of how to love themselves, which means in this context, they don't know how to be embodied because if you don't know how to love, then how do you bring your consciousness into and connect to yourself with empathy and compassion? Mm. Yeah. And I, the problem with English is we, we do tend to put a lot of things in one bucket. I mean, like you talk about ego. Well, that means different things to different people. It's got a different you know, a psychoanalytic meaning, a Buddhist meaning, and a common sense meaning, all of which are completely different. Um, love has so many meanings. Some people talk about love and they're talking really what I'd talk about. I'd call it obsessive attachment. You know, the, most of the love songs on the radio are obsessive attachment songs. They're not love songs. Um, so uh, we're talking about quite different things under one, in one bucket. So yeah, a, a really key question is just show me how you do that in your body. And then, then for example, what someone else calls anger, I might call irritation or hate. It might have a completely different 
label for me. It doesn't really matter. But if I can, the, the concrete things, the action in their body. I think it could be simplified by saying that true acts of love enhance connection and anything regardless of how you name it decreases connection if it's not love. Okay, so again, I, I'm not sure I'd use the word love just because it has so loaded for so many people. Um, I'm certainly a fan. Well, I'm trying to use it within the context of the definition that I gave you. Right, still incredibly broad. And I'd go, how would that... I'm always a pragmatist, like what's useful, right? So where is it useful to talk about love? Where is it useful not to? And this is why often for me it just comes down to skill sets. I work with skill sets because people, skill sets don't get in the way. People can learn skill sets. They can see if they can do them or not, and we don't have to get too abstract. Well, yeah, I could go on a long rattle with you on that because there's a lot of people that traumatize people with their skill sets. So uh, I think what we're really talking about can be simplified to healthy connection versus unhealthy connection. Can you ride that one? Um, for me, embodiment is definitely about connection. And I, I, we can look at specific things within that. So, for example, I was uh, with students. We work with, towards healthy and unhealthy humor, and often we talk about towards and away humor, humor that creates connection, and humor that breaks connection to self or other. So, I, I can certainly see some parallels. Yeah, good. I'm finally. We finally found a meeting place. <laughs> <laughs> You see, Mark, I'm a very practical person too. Uh, you know, I don't. If you studied my work, you'd see that I grew up on a farm. Where I'm come from, it either works or you, you, it either works or you starve to death. Period. And so, at the basis of my work is 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 practicality. But the reality is, we're in a world full of people with a myriad of all these ideas and concepts, many of which cause diseases. So I've had to spend my life studying dysfunctional belief systems, at least from my point of view, based on my clinical experience, so that I could have a context with which to meet a person where they're at. Because if I just say to them, oh, your beliefs about God are not practical, it's bullshit, then I have lost a patient and I can't help them. <laughs> yeah, you have to meet people where they're at. And I, I've, what I've seen of your work, for example, at the conference, I liked it very much. So um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mark, one of the challenges I see with embodiment practice is that they're frequently treating the symptoms of deeper issues that led to disembodiment. You can dance, roll, breathe, shake all you want, but if you have a deep issue such as abandonment, sexual trauma that's unresolved or even unconscious, or are getting genetic transfer of stress and trauma through the family tree, DNA as Mark Wulun's work and many researchers have shown is factual, you're likely to uh, feel better as long as you're what I would say only in terms of, of our conversation, medicate with such practices. I'm curious, how do you work with people to get to the etiology of their disembodiment and how important do you feel that is for people in general? No more five syllable words, please. Um, so <laughs> cause. I, I can't cause. Do it. I'm too simple. Causes. Oh, no, 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 you mean. Uh, okay. So I agree with you that we can be papering over the cracks. So there can be someone with deep trauma issues that's just using a yoga technique to self-regulate, right? And actually, we shouldn't um, mock them in that, in that that might be the thing that keeps them from becoming a heroin addict or a suicide. Well, I'm not mocking. I'm, I'm asking a deeper question about etiology or cause for you. Sure. So... Let's acknowledge that people do things that sometimes are treating surface symptoms, and that can be okay. All right, that's the first thing I want to say. Um, the next thing I'd say is that, you know, I'm with you that there can be deeper things happening in people's trauma, or people's cultural backgrounds, deep belief systems that are always embodied, remember, as well. There's no such thing as a belief system without a corresponding embodiment. That's a bi directional link. Both of those things are, you can go in either way. You can go in by the belief system or by the body. Um, so I think, yes, that's a risk people do that um but i'd have a question back to you mr philosopher is what do you mean by deep and the, the related question would be where are these things if they're not in the body like you mentioned dna well that's embodied where are they well if you look at the current research for example on water the body is made of you know depending on how old you are and how dehydrated we'll use a simple term 70 percent water current research on water which was investigated because I don't know if you're familiar with the Cray supercomputer, but 
as far as the public sphere of knowledge goes, it's considered to be the most powerful computer in the world for its processing power. And the hard drive is made out of water. And they're now using water in the development of quantum computers as the hard drive. And scientists wanted to figure out how on earth could such a simple molecule carry so much information. And the results of the scientific research were presented by Greg Braden in his show on Gaia TV, which is uh, Missing Links. And what they found was actually quite interesting, and that is that the water itself is not carrying the information. The water is connecting to a non-local field in which the information is being stored, which is why it can store so much energy, uh, so much information. And uh, so this comes back to the issues of mind. Where is the mind? What is the mind? And there's tons of research. In fact, there's an entire book called One Mind by Larry Dossey documenting the fact that we're all really part of one mind. And our mind is essentially, energetically speaking, like an eddy or a vortex in a larger body of mind or field of mind. So that that's the... So you're saying that... Uh... Uh, aside from Guy TV being a, a terrible source of proper science, you know, there's, there's some, some potential pseudo crap in that. I'm sorry, Paul. But let's say it is, I'll go with it. You know, there are non local phenomena in kind of quantum kind of physics and stuff like that. Okay. So I don't, um, I don't discount that as a possibility for sure. That there's non local phenomena and that's a part of it. And there's an, you know, interconnected fields and things like that. It's, it's not my area of expertise, but I certainly don't discount that. Uh, there can certainly be a subjective sense of that between people and even across time. Like, for example, if you've ever done improv comedy, they'll talk about this as a sort of phenomena. And it's a very practical thing for improvisational comedians. Um, you know, martial artists have a sense of this. And I, uh, I think it's certainly part of the equation, though, when there isn't good science on something, and I, I don't, I'm not yet convinced there is in this, this area. Um, and, I'm in the realm of conjecture. I'm a lot more cautious what I would teach compared to things that are more grounded. Well, you know, that's probably good for you. And um, I would be careful about discounting Gaia as just junk information because Greg Braden's a very famous scientist with a lot of credibility and he's referring to science. Some of this was done by the military. So uh, I don't know if you consider that junk science or not. But I think the thing is, uh, be health, be a, be a healthy skeptic, but look into it. Otherwise it's, it's just another, uh, you know, it, it's playing poor chess is what it is. And it's good to be a skeptic, not a cynic, right? I mean, exactly. you know, two mistakes one can make with information being open-minded or closed-minded. Right. And there's, there's some healthy gating of mindedness that I think is, is appropriate. And we've, we're presented with that much information in the modern world that I tend to sort of be a little cautious around things. You know, I don't believe the first thing I'm told about a subject um, in, until it's had a, A, I've studied it thoroughly myself. And I think there's a humility in that. And we have a, we have a responsibility, Paul, as people with audiences to only convey things that we've thoroughly looked into and there is a good evidence base for, or we personally have a very strong experiential base for. And I, I'm cautious. That's exactly on, what I'm doing. That. yeah well for me i i haven't had that so i i, I kind of have to go well i don't know you know i think it's the easiest thing to say there paul the to say. a lot of a, a lot of my questions for you are based on my own experiences and i've spent the majority of my life both as a practitioner of tai chi trained by monks as a child in meditation and using uh, other abilities. I'm a remote viewer. I have a lot of skills that I've spent my whole life working on that bring the standard concepts of mine into serious question. So when I'm making these kinds of statements as the basis of my questions, they're not just intellectual diatribe. They're based on my own life experiences. I hear that. I hear that. I'm not, I'm not saying you're talking bollocks, Paul, just to be clear. I, I'm saying we're getting into a realm which is uh, in the realm of questioning and conjecture, which is fine, and not in the realm of something I could write a book about. Okay, well, I appreciate the honesty.
Hi, you guys. I know you all know that super green powders are good for you if they're made from organic sources and they're processed properly. So the nutrients are there. And that's exactly what Paleo Valley does with their super greens powder. So I brought Autumn Smith in to tell us exactly how she created it and why and what it's going to do for you when you try their amazing organic super greens powder. Autumn, what is the magic you've got here? Well, like you said, we all need to get more of those micronutrients that you find in fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we've created a powder that you do not have to choke down. It has an absolutely delicious berry lemonade flavor. And the reason that it's different is because A, it is all organic, 23 organic superfood ingredients. And B, it is a very, very gut-friendly product because what I've found in my practice is that a lot of people don't do well with cereal grasses. And we know cereal grasses, like wheatgrass, can contain lectins that can be hard on the guts of a lot of people I work with. And so what we did was we created a a cereal grass-free alternative. We use high quality, the cleanest, highest quality spirulina on the market, raised in India. And then we added the 22 other organic fresh fruits and vegetables, and the flavor will surprise you. So all you have to do to check it out is go ahead to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15, at checkout. My son drinks it every day. We call it his ninja juice, and I sincerely hope your family loves it as much as ours does. All right, everybody, go paleo green and get rocking. Hope you love it. And, you know, I also wanted to share that I, even though I stated the question as potentially people medicating themselves and not getting to the issue... I also feel that any act of honest self-care is very, very positive because that's somebody who's making an action towards caring for themselves. And I think that is itself a a symptom of embodiment. Yeah, there's a nobility in that and there's a positivity in that we could say, you know, self-care is an interesting one because it's sort of been promoted to us, I think, in some ways supported by the powers that be that self-care is about doing yoga and taking bubble baths, you know? But actually, what is self-care on a deeper level? Self-care on a deeper level is about being connected to our life purpose, about being intolerant of people that waste our time. It, it's, it's about being in connection with nature. It's about being in connection with our ancestry, about how much we matter and where we come from. You know, there's such a deeper possibility, I think, your shamanic background that might resonate with, right? There's such a deeper possibility there than simply take a bloody bubble bath because you're stressed. Maybe you're stressed because you're in the wrong job and you hate your life. You know, maybe you should take the bubble bath. Maybe you should go to your boss and tell him where to stick it. And that's exactly why a lot of people are suffering from a lack of embodiment because it's the only option they've come up with is to check out. Yeah, it's a survival strategy. I mean, ultimately, disembodiment is by definition checking out. It's not feeling... And people do that for, you know, big traumas or just little, you know, just not liking their life, not wanting to be present in a life which doesn't match their values. And I think that's, that's critical, right? And, 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 and I a hundred percent agree in my system, as you probably saw from my presentation, I speak of four doctors, doctor happiness. What, what is happy making for you? And are you willing to do that for yourself or wait until you've got a disease for someone else to tell you (laughs) doctor movement? You have to pay attention to the movement of your bot, your emotions and your mind, because each of those has needs to be met. And if you don't satiate those needs, you end up with some kind of internal stressor. Doctor diet, you have to be aware of what you feed your physical body, your emotional body, and your mental body, because those are three levels of being that all exist within us. You know, for example, if I put you in a room and forced you to read a bunch of fluffy shit that you don't like, it wouldn't nourish your soul. But if I gave you some highly practical inflammation, information that, that you could use in your work, some part of you would be getting nourished. But a huge amount of people are not nourishing their emotional needs nor their mental needs. They're doing what they think they have to do to make a living, which is usually not even doing a job that they like. In fact, research uh, cited by Arnold Schwarzenegger in a talk from Europe showed that 75% of Europeans on massive surveys stated that they hated their jobs and 70% of U.S. citizens said they hated their jobs. 
So how do you spend 40 plus hours a week doing something you hate without somehow departing from yourself to survive it? For sure, for sure. Yeah, if you're you're going against your own values, which you, even though you may have been disconnected from, on some level they're there, how can I put this? Crying underneath the distraction. Yes, and so the final doctor in my system is Dr. Quiet, which is being aware of the need for physical rest, emotional rest, and mental rest, and having time for introspection so you can really be in touch with your inner world. Most people in, in our world today suffer from what I call externalization of the self, which means their whole sense of identity is externalized. My car, my bank account, the clothes I'm wearing, the status I have, who I hang out with, but oftentimes come into a midlife crisis because they don't know who they are and they don't have the energy to maintain the show anymore. And then, then what do I have to do? I have to bring them back into themselves but really, I tell people, I quote uh, a psychologist, Jerry Wesh, who says, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. And I found that to be absolutely very, very true. Say that again. That's interesting. Say it again. If you have a big enough dream, you do not need a crisis. For what? Sorry, to, to make change. It means if you have something bigger than your sense of immediate self that you're working on or contributing to, be, be it, you know, cleaning up the environment, uh, doing a job that you love. For me, my dream is the Czech Institute. It's bigger than me. Therefore, I don't need a crisis to fill my time or to force me back into myself because I'm engaged in something that requires me to be in myself or I can't fully contribute to the dream. Yes, yes, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, for me, the body is the radar of what we care about. So I've done courses on life purpose. The, when the body, there's a few things it does. One is the sense of lighting up. You know, what do we have energy for? What is the thing you'll get up early for? You know, I was, I was up at 5 a.m. to work this morning. You know, it's now 6 p.m. I was like, I couldn't stay in bed. You know, what's the thing you have energy for? And then the other one is, what's the thing where you have deep ease? You know, like when I first met my wife and there's that kind of like, hey, I could just sit next to you on a bed for the next 50 years. Let's do this. You know, like that. Deep yeah, ease. that's how like, being Penny are. And, and yeah, yeah and Andrew, all right. I have two wives. Sometimes, but often people talk about excitement and energy, which is part of it. And the other half is the sort of flow, the deep ease, the chill. And, you know, those two things. And equally, when something is against our values, it might just be a little tweak in the stomach if you're you know, embodied and you're tuned in, or it might be cancer, you know, it might be something really serious because you didn't hear the whisper. So, you know, for me, that's the what I call always, the pain teacher, the pain teacher. Okay. If you're not listening to the, the life, the sort of life purpose one, you get the pain one instead, huh? Well, if you're not listening to your heart and following your passion, your, your, you know, your, your, your heartfelt passion, which for you is obviously linked to embodiment for me, it's all the things that I do, but like you, I get up very early. I typically get up anywhere from 3.30 to 4.30 in the morning, so I have time for my spiritual practices and, and to really truly be in and with myself, knowing that I'm 50% of every relationship I have, and if I'm 10% not there, that's 10% you can't access, 10% I'm not accessing, that's a 20% deficit, and you know, to put that into context, imagine if somebody has a field of vision 20% reduced and they're driving a car or, or flying an airplane or using a power tool, it leads to problems. So uh, I think that um, being in and with ourselves out of love and passion for being, just literally for the miracle of being is a good start. But having something to inspire us and, and motivate us and make us help us feel connected. You know, for example, I'm sure a lot of the people that you spend time talking to and learning from help you feel even more connected to your own passion and give you a deeper knowledge of embodiment, be they martial arts teachers or dance and movement educators. But those things keep us thriving because we're growing in in love really in connection and through that process we actually radiate that out to other people 
and help inspire them to do the same because through us, they get to see what it looks like to be present within ourselves and engaged and not just caught up in <laughs> dramas created by the pain teacher. <laughs> yep. Makes total sense. Uh, Mark, if you consider the dangerous effects of social media, gaming, and overexposure to computer screens and phones uh, that has had it, what it's had on top of us, all of on top of what we've discussed so far, it seems to me that the medical, if the medical systems worldwide were really interested in health and healing, they would have used their power to influence governments to investigate and control these technologies to limit their damaging effects on people, families, societies and cultures around the world. Why do you feel these issues are being ignored, and what do you feel the financial cost to taxpayers worldwide is as a result of the illnesses, disease, injuries, and lost time from work and disconnection from ourselves and the impact on our relationships? Because all of these things are actually creating disembodiment that we've been discussing. So I'm just curious as to your opinion on why when we have clearly got uh, enough medical expertise and scientific expertise as many many documentaries such as social dilemma show why why is this stuff not being handled in ways that are life affirmative and, and health affirmative and humanity affirmative yeah i mean i think it's very simple that it became a huge economic force before we knew what was going on i think when we first took on this technology like with any technology we went oh this is great you can stay in touch with your friends from around the world that's brilliant right yeah and we didn't realize that we were becoming little dopamine addicts we didn't realize that we were getting put into this fight fight response for the benefit of advertisers we, we thought you know we were getting a free product and we didn't realize we were the product you know this is old saying <laughs> like, that's a good one <laughs> well it's just an old saying i didn't invent it if the product's free you're the product right and we were just like oh this is really nice facebook or whoever it is to make us this free product of course we were the product we had a, it was a great experiment i don't think it was a conspiracy or even nefarious i think many of the founders of these companies just had a cool idea and they rolled it and at a certain point the whistleblowers came and went hang on a minute there's something happening here we're getting people hooked on something and we're creating bad you know what buddhists would call sort of aversive mind states and I noticed it in my own life. You know, I started getting angrier. I started like being addicted to it. I started getting in trouble and saying things. The lack of empathy that happens online because the normal embodied connection things. Like we've had a fairly heated discussion at times today, but we're here. We're looking at each other. We can see the other one's basically friendly. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not seeing any ill will in you at all. And it's like, it's not a problem. Whereas if this was on Facebook, we wouldn't have those mechanisms. And if we were in person, it would be even friendlier, right? So when the empathic mechanisms are removed, that's a problem. And I think we've done a great experiment. We're now just waking up to the real cost of it for our mental health, for young people's mental health. And I think it's time we started treating it like a highly toxic drug and at least saying, you know, in the same way as we don't let kids take cocaine, we don't let kids take heroin. You know, I'm generally libertarian about most things, but when something is not is negatively impacting the health of our of a world, you know, in many ways, politically, the polarization is part of this as well. At a certain point, we have to say, hang on a minute. And I think Congress in the US and, you know, Parliament in the UK is waking up a bit late. And now there's financial interests involved. You know, the biggest companies in the world are all information companies. Yes, they are. And and we are their product. The fight back against this is one of the key battles of our generation, of our times. It is. It may be one of the key battles in history. I was going to say, if, if you look at the knock-on effect of this, it's, uh, you know, it's pointing in a direction that if we don't do something about it very quickly, the outcome could be devastating. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, you know, because you brought something up about you and I kind of sparring here. Um, I teach people that conflict is an important part of a healthy relationship as long as you can stay heart centered. Nothing meaningful ever happens. If, 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 if everyone just agrees with you, then you become very blind to your own uh, blind spots. So, you know, for me, 
we're just having what I call a great podcast where we really put things on the table, share our opinions and, and let the listener be educated and choose whatever they want. But if, if we don't have healthy conflict, then what you have is exactly what's going on now. Instead of having the healthy conflict to produce something that is digested upon and looked at by all of us, then you just have censorship, which means we don't want any conflict. We want confirmation to our bias and you must conform or you cease to exist, at least electronically. And I think that is how you, you know, as soon as you start getting into monocropping in nature, you start killing the diversity that keeps it alive. And as soon as you start censoring human beings or censoring your true feelings in a relationship, personal, professional, or otherwise, then you're actually not having a relationship anymore. You're, you're doing some kind of confirmation bias that leads to disconnection and confusion. So I celebrate our, our differences and say that's what is making it fun. Right. For me, and this in some ways agreeing is against the spirit of what you just said, but let me at least add to it or give a slightly different angle that you know, people are obsessed with diversity in the modern world. But what about intellectual diversity? What about diversity of opinion? And if we can't tolerate different views when they become verboten, you know, forbidden, when different views become almost sinful, they have this religious quality in the modern world to have any opinion other than the prescribed one is not just a different view, but makes you an evil person. And at that point, you're not, when you're an evil person, you're not a human anymore. You're eroded. You're simply to be killed. Not to know you're, you're an object. An object, exactly. Objectification, the opposite of embodiment, right? Embodiment, subjectification. So when someone, when we say anyone that has a different view, we can't be in relationship. So even though we've had a few, you know, disagreements here, I've had a sense that we were in relationship. At the time, it was basically respectful. There was passion at times, but it wasn't. Um, I was not discounting you as a human, and I didn't feel like you were me. And that ability is getting more and more lost, and I think that's dangerous because the only thing that's left is violence. That's all that's left once we dehumanize each other. So the the ability to be in connected conflict or relational conflict is, is the alternative to killing each other. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wait, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes Magnesium Breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy Bioptimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it and what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Are you familiar with the integral psychologist named Keith Witt? I don't. I know Ken Wilber, but Keith Witt, I don't think I know. Well, okay, Keith Witt is, is one of Ken Wilber's key people in his integral life uh, system. Oh, okay. And I've interviewed him and, and have a friendship with him. But he, he uh, said something very interesting, which I thought was quite relevant to our discussion here. He said... If you go far enough back in the history of tribal societies, you find there was a point where they did many tribes did not have a language to describe anybody outside of their own tribe. Because of that, they were not seen as people. So when other tribes came into their hunting territories or uh, engaged them, 
They had no problem killing them because they did not see them as living beings. They saw them as objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you'll still see this in a lot of cultures have Jews and Gentiles, Gajin, Guaylo, uh, Ferenc in uh, Ethiopia, us or not us, right? And it, the, the us is, is, is subhuman in many ways. And the extension of the tribe to bigger and bigger groups has been the moral victory and moral growth of humanity over the last 3,000 years. Yeah. You know, there are many systems that aid embodiment, ranging from massage to Feldenkrais therapy and Alexander work to yoga, dance, martial arts, foam rolling, Swiss ball work, postural training and practices to balance work and more. I'm wondering what tips you can offer people that they may not know for people that don't know where to begin their embodiment practice. For example, in your book, you talk about the ABC centering exercise on page 19. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, make any suggestions or share your ABC approach. Yeah, I mean, ABC, people can find on YouTube. It's a great practical self-regulation technique, aware, balance, core, relax, connected, ABCC sometimes. I can take people through that, but there's a bigger question here, which is, What's your route into embodiment? Now, this diff- I help people a lot with this as I'm a sort of curator of embodiment communities, not just an embodiment teacher. I've become this almost like trusted librarian of the embodied world, embodiment world kind of thing, you know, with the conference and other things. And um, the first question I would say is like, if you're new to it, just do what you love. Just do what appeals to you. For me, it was Aikido. For you, it might be conscious dance. For you, someone else, it might be, you know, yoga, whatever. Great. Feldenkrais. If you're new to it, just whatever brings you to the body that you enjoy, assuming the teacher isn't abusive, it's not a cult or anything like that, right? So that would be for beginners. Just do what you love, man. You know, bring what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy that brings you into the body. Those of us who have been around a bit longer, I would refer them either to a character development model or the the skill set model again and say, what skills are you trying to build? Because the, the problem is, people mostly just pick practices which deepen their neurosis people pick the practices that are comfortable but the practices are comfortable precisely because they 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 they, you already have the skills that they're teaching right so for slightly more advanced practitioners i might look for practices that while still enjoyable and at least tolerable are building skill sets that you don't currently have um so that's one take on it or if you know, you can paint with, we use a four elements model and we use very broad brush strokes. And we say, right, okay, you need a fiery practice because you're a watery person to build a bit more range, back to range. Um, so that's re- usually the starting point is not, you should do Aikido because Mark does Aikido or you should do conscious dance because you saw it on TV last night. But like, what do you want to build? And then of course, it's a bit more complicated than that because it's not just the practice, the what, it's where you do it, with who, in what way, when in your life. So getting the guidance of someone who's a coach who understands embodiment can be very, very helpful to select a practice that will be a good fit. And on our courses, we sometimes send students to do experiments and they'll try six different things and then they'll pick one and they'll do that for three months because you've got to commit to something if you're going to get any depth with it and yeah, not just shop around all the time. So usually that's the process we have of, of of reflection experimentation peer feedback so you, you say oh, i need to develop a fiery practice i'm gonna go do israeli martial arts and your friend's like bad idea mate that's not gonna help you know you need a watery practice yeah. so you, you've got to get a bit of feedback in there too because we're blind to our own stuff as you talked about shadow earlier um so yeah but i mean centering is just a very practical tool it's often a place i start when i'm working with groups because pretty much everyone's stressed. You know, I've had some stress today. You'll probably have some stress today. Most people will benefit from some kind of stress tool. <laughs> there's very few people that are like, no, there's no stress in my life. You know, take your stress tool and shove it up your ass. No, you, very few people would say that when offered it. Yeah, very few. You know, speaking of what you were saying earlier, uh, I in my lectures, I often tell people the yogis, and the weightlifters would do a lot better if they would just trade locations about three days a week because they would get all the things that are not part of their bias that they need and that would balance them out. <laughs> Same thing. I had an experience. I went to one of the big yoga studios in London a few years back and I, I did two classes in a row. I did uh, like a rocket power type class, which is really yang. And then I did a yin class afterwards to relax. And I like both and I like to build both. And the people who came into both classes, all the type A personalities from the City of London came into the Rocket one. 
And all the sort of super soft floaty hippies came into the in one. And I went, guys, you need to swap classes. You know, you're in the wrong place. You know, just just coming yes. out earlier, <laughs> later, you'll be fine. Yes. You know, it's like they hadn't spotted that. You know, and who yeah. knows? Maybe that they, there's also a cause and effect thing here, but that's that's one of the classic ones. And you know, the problem now, Paul, is not that people don't. Your question's very astute. In that, the problem is not that people can't find an body practice. It's that they can't choose, or if they do choose, they don't choose very wisely. So one of the things I've done in, you know, my works and in the conference and the, you know, the events we do, you know, Embodiment Unlimited is the latest vehicle for it, is uh, the company I run now, uh, is try and help people select teachers. You know, we have guest teachers, we have many teachers, we have different styles. We, you know, on a course, we'll introduce people to 10 different practices. We'll give people, you know, also we want to give people quality. So it's yoga isn't yoga. It's, t- you know, 100 kinds of yoga. And, it, and within any kind of yoga, there's good teachers and bad teachers. So, you know, being the, the what we provide, I think, now is uh, quality control, you know? And what we provide now is um, helping people be discerning. The, it's not like in my mum. My mum did yoga, right? But in the 60s, she had to drive, drive 40 miles to the nearest yoga class, and it was the only one. And that was it. It was Tuesday nights, 40 miles away. Now, you can do thousands of yoga classes. It's a very different problem. So this has become my kind of role, I would say, in the embodiment community is helping people be discerning it's also back to the super saturation con concept because uh, there's so much of everything that people really don't know how to discern until they go and find out that it either works or doesn't work which i think is one way to do it but having a filtration system like you have would be just like you know referring to a high quality organic certification such as the demeter association you know if it's got their stamp it's worth eating but a lot of the organic certifications are just bogus crap so you have to sort of know who you can trust to be your filtration system and i think that's why people like you and i that devote our lives to a given path actually develop the depth of understanding and and uh, awareness to help guide people based on what it is that they really need i think that's part of really what we do yeah i mean there's too many options right i mean it's like you know you you can't date everyone to find a wife but you could date 10 people that your friend who knew you really well introduced you to right so like people are having that trust in that and i I think you know that in the modern world experts inverted commas that's the role we can play that's really helpful is, is saving people a lot of time, energy, and frankly, sometimes heartbreak and injuries. So, um, you know, like I, I want students to avoid some of the mistakes I made. I want students not to be abused. I want students not to hurt themselves physically in bad martial arts classes. I want students not to be taken advantage of by sleazy yoga teachers. You know, there's things we can, there's some real serious stuff we can save people. I say, that's a red flag. Be careful of that. And I, I can pre-warn them. And, you know, my students are learning so much more rapidly than I learn. Because because they're standing on their shoulders, they're having that um, a, a lot of those lessons. They're learning a lot quicker. Yeah, on page uh, on page eighty six of your book, you have a section titled "Learn to Play." My observations as a therapist and a student of culture, religion, philosophy, science, and cultures around the world has shown me that once we became agrarian cultures and started building fences, protecting food f- supplies, staking out our land versus your land, and got deeper into military defense strategies, organized religion that became what I call outcome. We became what I call outcome oriented people and lost, uh, and lost what many of the natives had and a few still have, which is the awareness of the need and application of what I call unbound play. Personally, I've found unbound play very helpful for people to learn to relax and begin inhabiting themselves When we realize there is no outcome, no measuring stick, no grades to be given or comparisons to be made, then the people get out of their heads and become present with themselves. themselves. And one of my personal hobbies is rock stacking and creating things out of rocks. And it's been amazing for my physical, emotional, and mental and spiritual well-being. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on the relationship between our having become so out oriented and the, and the connection to our problems of disembodiment today 
Paul, I think that's the longest uh, question I've ever been asked. But uh... oh, well, I, I can add, I can add a little for you if you want to break it down real good. I think what you said was talk about play. That's what I heard you say. So it was uh, a state. It was a statement of my own experience, yeah. coupled with a, a deep uh, history of how we got that way. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm with you. First of all, um, I think play is. We've been talking about learning and connection all the way through this podcast, right? And play is our most fundamental way of learning and connection. There's a guy called Fred Donaldson. He does something called Original Play, which has influenced me a lot. Um, naturally, I'd say quite a playful person. I developed a very playful style of Aikido. I'm very playful in other things. There's things like improv I've studied. Um, so it's a key part of embodiment, I would say. And when, we, when we're over-regulating ourselves, uh, you know, you see this in some martial artists, some yogis, some meditators, we lose that capacity, capacity to freely express in an uncensored way. And of course, people are conditioned to um, not freely express because it's 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 punished, right? To have you know make certain noises, to say certain things. Um, so I think reclaiming that is both a gift of embodiment and a and a way into embodiment. Yeah, I really see too. It's very important for children. Having studied Steiner's system of education and and many others, Steiner showed that. Kids should not read or do mathematics until at least at minimum the age of seven because the right brain comes online first. And as soon as you start getting a kid to read or do math, it pushes them into their left brain and they lose their sense of wholeness, how things connect together. And so what I see, and I work with a lot of child prodigy athletes and people bring me problem children on fairly regularly. So I get to see a lot of these things. But what I've seen is, is that we've got kids already, by the time they're six, eight, nine years old, stressing about meeting homework assignments, reading a pile of stuff, and, and, and they're like little tiny executives. I've even seen them walking through airports, pulling a little tote bag full of stuff. They've got the thick glasses like they've been reading all their life, and they can't see. Their posture's all hunched over. They look like miniature CEOs. And so we have this outcome-driven culture and i i think real play has no outcome it's just exactly. pure play if it's goal directed it's not pure play right so non-goal directed activity is one of the things that gets lost with an a cultural emphasis on productivity and now of course the irony is it can make you incredibly productive and it comes up with all the best ideas for your business or whatever it is right there's the irony I mean, I, you know I've, I've played my way into an embodiment conference for half a million people right i was playing the whole time but it's like it can you know, there's a paradox there However, yeah, it's definitely a cultural bias. And I think uh, rightly, as you say, when it's imposed upon children, you know, targets and goals and they've got exams, at, you know, even at five years old, I think it's crazy. I mean, let kids be kids and have that play and also let adults have that play as well, but definitely for kids. Yeah. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony and you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their Organic Longevity Formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. Because so, you know, so many people come to me in, in real trouble, uh, I can't think of a single case in many, many years, as far as I can remember, where I did not need to introduce a form of play that would work for them, be it 
painting without any attachment to the outcome or singing or skipping rope or going for a walk or, you know, whatever it is I can get them to participate in where there's simply zero attachment to the outcome. I've never had a single case of someone that did not feel better participating in those activities and feel all of a sudden they could hear the sound of the birds on their walk where they didn't even hear it before. Cause all they could think of is how many steps can they get in and can they get to work on time? You know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's become a weird luxury and uh, yeah, to, to be against the clock the whole time, I, you know, sometimes my life becomes like that and um, it's, it's, it's not healthy. You know, as I'm thinking here, I just realized there was a question I forgot to write in to the, to the outline, but I'd like to ask it to you because I'd love to hear your opinion on it and I'll preface it by sharing my concerns. I've been around long enough in this profession to see the whole biohacking movement emerge. And what I've seen is that people have become addicted to electronic gadgets. And instead of actually having a relationship with themselves, they're externalizing their self-awareness to electronic objects. And then all of a sudden, if the the battery's dead or the power goes out, they're completely out of touch with everything from what time it is to what direction North is to what their heart rate is to their level of exertion to their carotenoid levels. I mean, they've got gadgets for every fricking thing under the sun. And to me, to me, that's, uh, if it's used that way, it disembodies, but if it's used as a vehicle to bring you into awareness, like For example, when I was a competitive fighter and a triathlete in my youth and heart rate monitors first came out, I thought, well, this is an interesting thing. I'm going to see what my heart rate monitor says compared to what my own monitoring of my carotid pulse is. And I used the heart rate monitor probably for about six months, but I kept checking. Okay, right now I feel like I'm about 186 beats a minute. And I could actually guess within about three to five beats a minute consistently. Then I said, okay, I don't need the heart rate monitor anymore. I'm, I'm dialed in. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, on biohacking and how that may be uh, problematic. And, and do you feel it, it can be supportive at all? Yeah, well, Paul, I'm sorry, but I've come to the exact same conclusion. And we had all the disagreements up front. Um, so in, in this case... Um, <laughs> I completely agree. I, 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 you know, I have a Fitbit. I sometimes measure my blood oxygenation, my pulse rates. I think it can be useful. I think it keeps us honest. Uh, it can give feedback that we're blind to sometimes. Uh, also, it, we're not very good at seeing patterns over time. So, you know, for example, I, I did a thing where I measured my happiness, you know, for a few years, for a year, sorry, a few years back, where it would go off five times a day. And I became aware of longer term patterns of happiness that you couldn't feel because there were longer term patterns. Um, but generally I agree with you hundred percent. It can be a way of not feeling going, well, I don't need to feel I can you know, outsource that um, and looking at the body in a very objectified way. So yeah, I think the, the subjective skills of being able to feel the body are the more fundamental skills. I'm curious what your thoughts are on all the AI and where that might take us with regard to embodiment. You know, it's very interesting. So I listened to a podcast called Lex Friedman, who I like, well, like Lex a lot, has great guests on, and um, he's a MIT uh, computer guy. And often they're talking about computers, and people talk about uploading your consciousness, but this is complete nonsense. You know, the brain in the complete nonsense. Yes, it is, it body, is. <laughs> you are, you, unless you recreate the body at a minute, maybe even cellular level, you can't recreate the consciousness. You can't download the consciousness. And I, I think things like Neuralink that, you know, this coming online in a couple of years, maybe even sooner from our, our friend Elon, who, again, who I like a lot, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, I think that hasn't been thought through. And I think if we've been screwed up by Facebook, oh, my God, are we going to get screwed up by Neuralink? And I, I, I think there will be, I mean, Marshall McCullen said that every technology that's invented atrophies a skill. So people used to be able to memorize epic poems when reading was invented, that stopped, okay? So even a book atrophy skill, the invention of books. Um, so what are the, I think the questions would be with something like Neuralink or something like that, AI, you know, whatever, would be what are the skills that would become atrophied and are there side effects of those skills atrophying that would dehumanize or damage us? And I think the answer is a whole bunch and hell yeah. So that is, a, it's a scary thing. 
And then there's another part of me that says, great, let's do it. I want to, I want to download Portuguese in 30 seconds. You know, now I know Kung Fu kind of thing, you know? So um, the Matrix, you know, where he learns Kung Fu in 10 minutes. You know, part of me would love to learn a language that way and there's other things. But um, yeah, I'm going to be pretty cautious of it. I'm honest. And I, I think he will do what we always did do, Paul, which is we adopt technology without thinking it through, without realizing how it's going to screw us up. And then later on, we try and repair the damage and it's too late. I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but that's what's going to happen. Well, I don't think you're being pessimistic. I think you're looking at the past and saying the trend is that we're likely to continue to do that in the future unless there's some sort of a miracle jump in human consciousness overnight. Um, Steiner made a profound statement, which I've shared a few times on my podcast, but I, I, I'd like to share it with you. Steiner said, man will continue to invent technologies outside of himself until he either realizes that they're all copies of more superior technologies within him or destroys the world. The question is, which will come first? Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm, as you say, I'm following a pattern. There's, there's only one case in human history that I'm aware of, of a society denying a technology because it's impact. And that was the Japanese giving up the gun. And that was a very particular society and with a very particular set of conditions. And of course, eventually Admiral Perry kind of turned up with a ship with cannons on and said, actually, guys, time to get up to speed, you know, um, forced them into the modern world in that way. That's the only thing I know of in human history like that. So it's possible, but um, we tend not to do it from the track record. So, um, yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, I think what could, there's a, let me be a few more positive versions of this. One could be, and I'm already seeing this, the pressures on our body minds are so intense in the modern environment with social media, modern workplaces, Zoom, etc., that embodiment skills become necessary and not a luxury of a, a geeky few. So, you know, I noticed this a few years ago that normal people started to do yoga. You know, actually well adjusted normal people with proper jobs and not my kind of freaky hippie mates. And I went, oh, the reason they're doing yoga is because they need to now. And that opens a door for a whole load of people. Like in the past, most people didn't meditate, even in Buddhist countries. Okay, in Buddhist countries, 10% of the monks meditated, let alone the population, right? In Thailand or Tibet, very few monks even meditated. Now, if you don't meditate, your brain doesn't work. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if the pressures of the modern world will force people to take on some of these body mind, psycho embodiment technologies. Uh, in a way which is um, a mass adoption of these technologies could happen for the first time in human history. And that would be very beautiful. Uh, the other thing I think could happen is we could split, the species could split. So I, I think we could actually have a tech species and a low tech species. And you see parallels of this in your friend group, right? Like you have friends that go, oh, I don't do Facebook. And you have friends that are like super into it and they're buying Bitcoin. And you know, you, you'll see this splitting happening. The problem is these guys are going to wipe out these people. That's the problem with the splitting, though maybe they'll let them live in the zoo or something, you know? So uh, I think what they, those two possibilities are pretty interesting. Yeah, I think it's happening right now on many levels. Um, the whole vaccination issue is certainly creating two very discernible camps of people. And... Uh, Yes. And then you have the technology, no technology. Um, it, it, it's sort of wild because <laughs> I hate to say it, but when I remember watching the movie Mad Max, it seems like we're moving in that direction. I mean, if you look into a crystal ball and say, well, we keep fucking around with nuclear technologies and biological warfare and advanced computer technologies. And the list is so freaking long now. It's just amazing that it's all hanging together <laughs> i mean it's amazing we didn't kill ourselves in the cuban missile crisis again in the 80s there's a couple of single russians who have saved the world thank god for those two russians um here's the problem Te as technologies develop they become cheaper and more accessible right yeah now how cheap and accessible do you want nanotechnology biological weapons independently you know uh, self-operating drones um, nuclear uh, chemical weapons. How 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 accessible do you want those? Because it only takes one crazy muppet. It just takes one idiot, right? It takes yeah. one guy with it. Well, he just just don't give a shit. You know, Timothy McVeigh blew up a huge building full of people with fertilizer. What if Timothy McVeigh had had what's on the internet now? And that was what twenty years ago. 
like you think, you think Timmy Tim? How many did he kill? Yeah, I don't know. Long while ago, it's about fifteen twenty years, I think. Right, we're getting older. So, how many people did he kill? Let's say a thousand. I forget the number, but it was pretty high. How many could he kill now? It would be a hell of a lot more. Right? How many could he kill in a hundred years? Ask Bill Gates. <laughs> Ask Bill Not Gates. Sure I'm gonna, <laughs> not sure I'm going to go there, but uh, I know what you're saying. So, you know, <laughs> the, the levels of social control and that uh, that can be done also by governments and corporations now is so much higher. You know, like Putin has a massive control network the USSR could have only dreamed of. You know, they had to rely upon informants. He has a camera on every street corner. Yes. I'll just say, too, that the the whole pandemic has really pushed people into a much higher awareness of health. Many of my friends are in some aspect of the healthcare business, be it product uh, supplement manufacturers or food, uh, whole food, you know, farmers and product makers or uh, cold plunge tubs or things like that. And all of them have had just skyrocketing sales and the, and the Institute's registrations have gone through the roof. So there is definitely an awakening happening that people need to kind of take, uh, kind of care of themselves. They have to get involved in their life or, or they're going to be susceptible to the next, whatever comes our way. Right. I think if people have realized they've got to take responsibility because you can't rely on the healthcare systems when they collapse. And all of a sudden there was this extra motivation to look at health also, the importance of social support has been highlighted by the lack of it, by isolation through lockdowns. Yes. And also boundaries has been really reinforced. People have really got a better sense of, hey, do I want to hug this person? Do I want to shake hands with this person? So there's a couple of, I can name a lot of negatives, but maybe let's finish with a couple of positives there. Well, yeah, the, the positives, I think, are that people are actually now starting to really look into what it means to be healthy and and initiating some kind of a practice, whether it be as shallow as just taking some vitamins and supplements, or whether it be as deep as detoxification, meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, uh, and, and education, getting really educated effectively. Do you have any closing comments, questions, or special offers you'd like to share with our listeners today? Yeah, I'd just say if anything inspired you in this conversation, you know, go out there and do an embodiment practice. If you already do one, maybe try a different one. You know, look up something like Continuum or Feldenkrais or something that's a bit more obscure. If you've been doing yoga for a while, try something else, you know. Obviously, if people like this stuff, embodiment podcast, they can look up uh, the books. Just put Mark Walsh on Amazon. Uh, No special offer, I'm afraid. I forgot to give a discount voucher, but I will personally blow a kiss to anyone who gives me a book review on Amazon. That would be much appreciated. Uh, and, you know, we have a company out there. People can find my stuff. I'm pretty easy to find on YouTube and all the normal channels. So just put my name, Mark Walsh and Embodiment, into the internet, and you'll probably come up with something that you'll enjoy for free. So lo- lots of free content out there if people want it. I was just going to say, I recently uh, I recently had a podcast with Eileen Troberman, who is a very, very skilled Alexander practitioner. And uh, for those looking for to try something new in the podcast, which I have on my YouTube uh, channel, which is for the podcast Living 4D with Paul Check on YouTube, she gives several very practical, simple demonstrations people can use. Uh, so there's another option uh, for people that want to try something new. Mark, what a fantastic uh, conversation we've had. We've, I think we've touched almost all the major issues of the world today. We have done it. We have, Paul, I have, my brain is fried. I'm glad I've got dinner now to just sit and chill for a minute to digest all that because that was a, a rich conversation. So, you know, thank you for bringing in new perspectives, for pushing back a little bit. I appreciate that. It's more interesting than a normal interview when it's a real discussion, as you said. So, um, yeah, really appreciate your time, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. I really believe in it. That's why I wanted you on the podcast and took the time to uh, get into your book. And, and, uh, actually it was looking at your book that made me say, wow, he's really got some substance here. I'd like to share him with the, with the listeners on the podcast, because I think these are important topics. And I think we did as good a job as we could possibly do to expose them today. Yeah. Pretty rich couple of hours. And if you want to come on my podcast to you know, give you some exposure as well, super happy to have you on mine. We can have a sort of round two a month's time. How's that sound? Yeah, sure. Just reach out to Penny. She's the master of my life, so she'll set it up. (laughs) I'll get Zoli to do that. He's the master of mine. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check. And today's guest 
Mark Walsh. You can visit Mark's website to find out more about the Embodied Facilitator course at embodiedfacilitator.com. Connect with him on Twitter and Instagram at walkmalsh, that's W-A-R-K-M-A-L-S-H. And visit the Embodiment Conference Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Embodiment Conference. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chakiva.com. 